If you are a first time buyer looking to get into investment properties, but don't own anything else, watch this video. Hi everybody, hope you're well. Uh, it's Pyam here from Niche Advice. Please do like and subscribe to our channel. We've got lots of information about mortgages and financing, all sorts of uh, good stuff there. Right, I'm getting a lot of calls from first time buyers, first time landlord uh, or would be landlord investors. So these are people that essentially do not own a property in the UK at all and are looking not only to buy a property, but not as a residential property for investment purposes. So they could be living with family, they could be renting themselves and looking to get, just get into property. Um, it could be lots of these, these people watching lots and lots of these YouTube videos out there saying that they're gonna be property millionaires. All they have to do is buy a property, do it up and sell it and that's how easy it is. Um, so let's uh, go through and give you some truths, give you some actual truths about how things work um, without taking a load of money off you. Okay, so um, the uh, I get it. I get it. Honestly, it's got a lot more now. I'm getting a lot of people saying, "Look, um, I'm looking to get auction finance. I'm looking to get bridging finance. I'm looking to do a HMO mortgage." So let's go through it one by one. Let's start off with a bog standard buy to let. Majority of the lenders in the UK, I would say 98% of all the lenders in the UK, before you can become a landlord, they want you to be a um, homeowner. OK, so what they want to see is you've got a mortgage, you've been responsible to pay that mortgage um, and you've got a history that and you've got a credit profile paying that mortgage going back some time. Um, so that's, I suppose, the starting point. So 98 percent of the lenders out there, if you don't own a property, they're not going to give you a mortgage. OK, so full stop. Now, there are a few lenders out there that will give first time buyer, first time landlords, buy to let mortgages in their own personal names, okay? Not in a limited company, but in their own personal names. The rule around that is um, they would want you to be able to afford that property as if it was a residential. So I'll give you an example. Say you wanna buy a property for 200,000 pounds, okay? But you're on 15,000 pounds a year salary. Okay, you cannot afford that property as if it was a residential. Okay, but if you want to buy a 200,000 pounds and your salary is 65,000 pounds, then it shows to the lender, look, I actually just want to buy this for investment terms. I don't want to buy it so I can move into it myself because if I did, it'd be a lot cheaper for me to get a residential mortgage. Okay, and I can afford it. Okay, so you've got to be mindful around that. That's the rule a lot of them have got. Okay, so the ones that will allow you to do that, they will work it on an affordability basis as if it was a residential. Right? So let's go away from that. So let's just assume that you can't go down that route. And a lot of the people, they've sort of figured that out by themselves and they do all sorts of research and get a, guess what? They come across bridging finance. Oh my God, bridging finance, so good, so easy. Everything got done so quickly. And now, you know, we own this property, we've turned this around and we're getting £3,000 a month rent. Right or wrong, let's talk about this. Um, bridging finance is not really designed for first-time buyer, first-time landlord. It's a mechanism whereby you can quickly get finance um, and you've got to have a level of expertise within that because it's not like a traditional mortgage. Yes, things can get done quickly. Yes, we do bridging finance for first-time landlords, okay? There are some caveats and there are some, some, some rules around that, but they're expensive. You need to know what you're doing. And I'm not just talking about me giving you advice. You really need to know what you're doing, what your plans are. You're gonna buy this property. Let's just assume you're gonna buy that 200,000 pounds property on the bridge, okay? Um, there's a couple of things you need to know about that. One, bridging finance. For normal bridging finance clients, the normal banks will give you decent rates. So I don't know, 0.45 to 0.6% a month, okay? If you are a landlord, you're an experienced and you can prove what you've done. If you're a first time landlord, those type of lenders will not lend to you. They don't, they don't, they think you're very high risk. Bridging finance is a high risk thing anyway. It's asset paced. However, they don't want to be, you know, going through the hassle of repossessing you. So, um, 
when you're going down the bridging front, that's the people that are going to lend to you, the people that are going to lend to people that are first time buyers with no track record, haven't owned a property, guess what? Their rates are going to be, they're certainly going to be north of 1%, 1.25, probably. Okay, so there's that. And essentially, they're banking on you failing so they can take the property as well. Okay, so they're the only lenders that will lend to you. Okay, the, the, the reputable lenders will stay away from this business. Okay, because they think it's a very high risk business. All right, so let's assume that you've said, no, I've got the money, I've got the resources. If things go wrong, I have got some money behind me and my deposit level. And let's talk about the deposit level. So a normal buy to let mortgage is 25% deposit. Okay, that's what the normal buy to let. There are some 80% loan to value, 20% deposits out there. But first time buyers, first time landlords, let's just keep it 25%. When you're going down the bridging route, uh, in, in, in the good old times before COVID, most bridging was being done around 70% loan to value, okay? Gross. What I mean by that is most of the lenders were adding on all the fees and the interest up front. So that 70% loan to value deal was probably becoming 67% loan to value. There are a few lenders that would lend 75% 70, loan to value, okay? So they were 75% loan to value. As soon as COVID came in, because surveyors could not go out and visit properties, all of those bridging lenders, because it is an asset-based lending, basically it's lending on property, essentially, although they will do checks on you, but they generally, you know, they're, they're looking after that property. Because surveyors couldn't go and see that property, a lot of them either pulled their products out of the market, so they're no, long, no longer lending, or they were lending very cautiously, uh, and there still are, a lot of them are, are lending around 60% loan to value. However, in the last couple of days, I've seen lenders come back out at 75% loan to value. Now, there's a couple of questions uh, and a couple of things you need to know. And this is why I'm saying, look, you know, it's not as straightforward. Most lenders, the way they value uh, bridging finance, they'll do it on a 180 day resale. So if the property had to be sold in 180 days, not on open market value. There are bridging lenders that will do open market value. However, as a first time buyer, first time landlord, I don't think those lenders will lend to you. Okay, so you've got to go down the lenders that will do 180 day resale value, which majority of them do. Some, however, will do 90 day resale value. So 180 day, 90 day, if the property had to be sold in 90 days, obviously that will determine the price. So it's really important. You don't just look at rates. You don't just look at, you know, fees. You look at the policies and that's what a good broker will be able to identify and, and, and tell you. Um, uh, so bridging finance is not is not a straightforward mechanism and it's got huge problems for first time buyers because you guys things go wrong okay look at look at look at the world we live in right now so things go wrong with projects okay and if you're sitting on a bridging finance paying 1.25 percent a month and you've already paid i don't know a two percent lending fee double the solicitor's fee the double the surveys fee all of those things will add up another catch to doing a bridging finance for first time buyer, first time landlords, is you don't have experience for an exit strategy. So I'll tell you what, what I mean by that. If the exit strategy is for you to do it and flip it and sell it, fine, okay? If the exit strategy is for you to do it up and then keep it and rent it, then you're gonna have a problem because remember all of those other buy to let lenders, they will not lend to you because you don't own a property. Yes you've now become a landlord. Yes, you're on the land registry now. So that deals with one aspect of it. However, most of them will still want a history of you being a landlord. So typically you'll have to hold it for six months. There may be some one or two lenders that will do it within three months. But I would say a lot of those lenders, and by the time you're done, you've put the mortgage application and everything, you know, you're talking six, seven months of holding that property on such a high rate. So, it's got to make sense. You've got to be adding a lot of value to make that sense. When I sit down and explain that to the people, the property millionaires that phone me up and say, I want to be a first time landlord. Can I talk to you about auction finance and bridging? When I start explaining to them the cost involved, the time lag involved, the detail of information that's needed, they all of a sudden go mm, back to the drawing board. I thought this was going to be straightforward. Um, so you just got to be mindful around this, right? Um, I do a lot of first-time buyer, first-time landlord deals, but I do them generally on buy-to-lets, 
okay and now let me show you let me show you how this can be done in a more um, secure way uh, in a more cost effective way and and, and certainly a, a safer way you don't own a property but you've got some deposit money okay so what you can do um, what you can do is buy with someone who has got landlord experience who does own a property who has got good income who has got a mortgage history and do it together okay for the first one for the first two so you're building um, your credit worthiness for the lenders so you're not getting yourself in trouble right at the start the worst thing you can do is go in and start getting bridging finances if you don't know what you're doing you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble i also get a lot of calls from clients that do get themselves in a lot of trouble and having to unravel all of that is an absolute mess because bridging lenders do not mess about they will come after you and they will look to take that property okay they will give you some time however if you have not delivered on what you said it's a commercial transaction it's a business okay so you've just got to be mindful there are different types of i'm, I'm just talking about buy to let and bridging and buy to let first time buy to lets um, so you can get around all of these rules by buying someone who is experienced okay so that's one option obviously go down the route of um, if you can't afford it I've got lenders that will accept you as a buy to let the problem is when you're trying to go down the auction route the lenders that the auction rules are normally to complete within 28 days or 30 days I'm telling you now at the moment when I send an email off to a lender it's taken them six days just to come back to me on that email okay so you've just got to um, uh, you've just got to be mindful that a mortgage a traditional mortgage cannot be used generally for these type of um, for these types of transactions things change when you become an experienced landlord because you may have other buy to lets that have got assets in there i can take a charge on that buy to let i can refinance that buy to let you become a cash buyer or your deposit gets better okay so um things can uh, evolve there's lots of things you can do in terms of obviously getting bridging finance pulling planning permission and changing it into a change of use to a hmo we do all sorts of things like that but you've just got to be uh, mindful you know i would if it was myself getting into it and i've owned property for the last 20 odd years i've been doing this for a long long time i would get my teeth into get into a buy to let at first maybe um, move into a hmo then um, but certainly going into auction finance and development finance and not being able to fund it yourself. Don't get me wrong. If you've got a lot of money behind you, fine. Then you've got some deposit there. You've got some money to fall back on. But if you're on 15 grand a year, um, you, it's not a right thing for you to do. Okay. It just isn't. Uh, and if, if someone is telling you that that's the right thing to do, they're lying to you. And you just got to be watch, watching yourself. Because I get the calls. I'll get the calls. Because we're prominent on the web. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. I'll get the calls from those people saying, look, I've got myself into bridging finance. I can't pay it. You know, I didn't get planning permission. I didn't manage to sell the property. There's a downtrend right now. So what's happening? When the market is great, you can flip these properties and make some money out of it. When the market is down, you've got to be cautious. Why do you think the bridging lenders are pulling their um, their products to 60% loan to value, 65% loan to value? It's not It's not because they want to. It's because there's, there's a lot more risk out there. So... Um, be mindful, speak to lots of people, speak to the accountants, speak to the solicitors, speak to lenders, speak to brokers uh, and make your mind up yourself. Um, but if you are interested in looking at getting a buy to their mortgage for the first time, we are here to help. We can help you in different ways, but you just got to have your eyes open and know what you're doing. Thank you so much.